Today we're going to go to the book of Jonah in your Old Testament, and we're going to go to the third chapter. For my video people, when you get it, just give me that thumbs up. If you're on the phone, just yell out, still save. I know we'll hear you. Jonah, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. And when you get it, give me that thumbs up. Amen. Jonah, the third chapter. Amen. Amen. It's a very small, small book, but power pack. Jonah, the third chapter, uh, verses one. All right, I get those thumbs ups. And I think we're all good. All right. So I'm going to read from the NIV version. And uh, this is what it say. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going uh, a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth that everyone allurgently call, call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Lord, add the blessing uh, to the reading and to the hearing of his most holy word. So our sermonic theme is heeding the call of an inconvenient service. Heeding the call of an inconvenient surface. Look, let me, let me say that there are those of you uh, like myself who have always uh, been in constant battle with persons over, uh, over the advocacy for the credibility uh, of our scripture, of this scripture and of the word of God. I have always said that, that uh, to those who would be anti-Christians, who do not accept this as the word of God, who, who would even go so far to say on things that were made up and be uh, uh, mythological characters or, or, or features. Our response had been that if that is the case, they sure could have made it a whole lot better. Uh, instead of, and, and maybe in somehow glossing over the frailties and the insecurities of those persons who make up this biblical canon. We are constantly bombarded with the imperfections of these persons in the Bible, which makes it much more real and not made up, simply because you can see ourselves in them. And just as they, in their imperfections, God still uses them 
so can God still use us in our own imperfections. Now, please know this, with Jonah, Jonah is indeed a flawed character, a flawed person whom we gloss over simply because we become so enamored with the thought of being swallowed up in the whale, with the whale. I mean, cartoons about Jonah and the whale and, and, and being swallowed up, a person trying to run from God's mission, yet gets caught uh, uh, with the whale. But, but to be clear here that Jonah and the book of Jonah is a tragedy in this sense that even though he was released from the whale, even though he carried out God's purpose for Nineveh and Nineveh is saved, if you read into the last chapter, you will see Jonah is disappointed that God still had mercy on people in Nineveh. Jonah, in his frailty, wanted to see Nineveh destroyed, which is one of the reasons why he didn't think that it would be fitting for him to go and try to save people that ultimately he wanted to see gone. And that's full, that's full disclosure, right? And our, and our biblical history still indicts the prophet for a failure, right, uh, 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 at the end of their failure in their ability to change, right? Now, now it's our challenge, right, of understanding of God that God can, in an instant, wipe away the past. And that's one of the good points about, jo about Jonah and Nineveh. Right, it, it is it is humanity who gathers in disappointment because we have feelings that that we see that with the great power and that God should use it to destroy, especially those who have been resistant to God's great favor. Come on, we we we've seen even ourselves in in judgment. We have seen that uh, 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 in judgment of others and and see how well they are doing. And whether we uh, uh, say it openly or feel it privately, uh, we declare and we say, look, I've been serving and I've been giving and I've been tithing, uh, yet my next door neighbor who don't even breathe, don't even breathe a breath close to the church, looks like they seem to be, do, be doing better than me and have less struggle than I have. And Lord, I've been in the mix serving for you. Right? It's the tragedy there in church of our flesh, right? That, that we believe who should reap benefits of God's favor as if we have attained that kind of spiritual uh, a role within God's, within God's hierarchy, right? In order that we can be able to see that and, and somehow make a pronouncement that, look, God, uh, I'm much more deserving than them, right? Surely, and that is for us, those who have Sunday after Sunday come into church and gotten up and given up our weekends for activities that we have done and have traveled from this convention and to this conference and have been in this organizational meeting. Now we feel and can have to be careful because we can feel a sense of entitlement as God's chosen. And, and, and we have to be careful because we will attain a Jonah persona, right? A Jonah insecurity of believing who should be entitled to God's grace and who shouldn't be, right? Come on, you can just imagine here somebody, somebody like the thief on the cross who uh, 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 all, all, all the thief has to do is declare before his dying breath that Christ is indeed the Son of God and that in believing in him will ensure a role in paradise. Keep in mind the thief from the record, from the record we had, never stepped one day into Sunday school. Uh, 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 we don't know how much scripture he may have read and been at a Bible study or may not have sacrificed any of his possessions for the Lord, but in that one moment was deserving of God's grace and mercy, right? 
And so, and so, and, and so this thing, right, this thing that, that all you have to be able to do is believe, right, and change is, is it much a part of the Jonah story than, than the well. Now, here then is the constant challenge of our belief, church, which is declare that our God is the God of the second chance, even though for us, God is the God of third, fourth, fifth, 30, 35, 99, 100. 100, 1,000, 1 million chances God then pulled us out of some mess that we didn't got into, right? So he's more than just the God of the second chance, but then we can become possessive about it and have to be careful, right? That when put in the mode of an inconvenient service or task for us to do, that we don't become judgmental as far as what we are supposed to be doing. Come on, come on. It happens, right? Right. The Bible draws on these moments of, 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 of redemption. Psalm 51, uh, verse 7, uh, 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 the king, the great king David, uh, in the midst of his uh, sins, claims, cleanse me with his sop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have trust, crush, rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. There then has to, he's looking for the God of the second chance and this need to be able to be within God's glory, God's, God's grace, right? And, and, and we see it even go further as we see the prophet in 2 Chronicles 7, if my people, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There then now is a group that had forgotten. And, and that's why the declaration and the proclamation needed to be made because if my people whom are called by my name need to be able to humble themselves, come down so much from that high horse. And, and even boy, that prophet uh, 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 Ezekiel, the great prophet having to look at those dry bones and preach to them, knowing where they were at. Surely, surely, surely if I'm in the, if I'm in the, if I'm in the stead of, you know, as a, as another preacher, right, having the task of being able to preach to dry bones means that you may not get an amen. You might not even know what's going on, but ultimately you see the end. They rose up and came back together. So, so again, this here, this, this, this story here, we have to be careful. Our faith does not become that which denies the world of receiving the second chance. Right. And the assignments for which we are given may put us into inconvenient times and opportunities, but yet God still requires us to act upon his will and to do his work. Uh, we were in a prayer meeting last week, and, and, uh, and, I, and, and I think it was following not too much far from the inauguration and we're praying and y'all heard me, those who were in the prayer meeting heard me uh, say, look, the Lord done convicted me that I have to pray for the outgoing president, right? That was not even part of the prayer meeting. We were in the prayer of, of rejoicing, right? That now we have this new president whose policies and things we may be able to agree with, but what kind of hypocrite would I be? If I denied the opportunity to pray for somebody whom I don't agree with, right? That's where we have to be careful because faith is not meant to place us on some high horse to look down on somebody. Or it's not meant for us to be put there in order that we look down in judgment on somebody. All of us have to make a personal accounting to the God that saved us and brought us. And so it, it, would, it would behoove us to know that, that in our prayer, we should pray for those whom we agree and also whom we, we disagree, right? But, but, but yet we have glory to God that God is the God of second chance, 
for an enemy can become a friend. A foe can become a soulmate. Okay. So, so, so here then is the context by which Jonah now has to preach, right, to people whom he disagrees with, of whom he ran from, right, and, and cause a ship to almost wreck simply because he felt he knew the best for what God wanted instead of doing what God would tell him to do. That's it. That's it here, church. And church. And in the process then now, as much as we like to hear about Jonah and in the whale, Jonah becomes a type of laughing stock. He is no more for the disobedience and rejection of a task than his commitment. This book is four chapters, but they are a significant view of what happens when you're disobedient. But even when you have a tarred, insecure spirit, God can still bless it and still save hundreds if we would just let God do it. Come on now. Jonah called into action to preach to the people of, of Nineveh. They would need to repent and get on proper footing with God or God would destroy them. The indication from the scripture that this was a large and intimidating people who were captivated by repeating sin. Jonah, who I'm sure here at church, loved God, rejected their offer and set out to avoid the responsibility. He was called but he didn't like what he was called to. Come on, come on, church. Like, what? I mean, we all have said, look, what's your Nineveh? Right? What is that task looming before you that you refuse to engage it simply because you don't like it or are afraid of what the results would be? What's that like? What's that like? What's that Nineveh that you would travel all around the world to forget about it and the whale still finds you in the midst of the ocean? That thing that keeps gnawing at you and gnawing at you that, that, that you need to be able to take care of and need to be able to step up to in responsibility, but you refuse to do it out of fear, out of insecurity, out of concern of what people will say, out of maybe the associations that you will lose simply because you're doing God's will. Oh, would it not be good if we could tell God what we wanted him to do instead of, uh, 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 instead of God telling us what he wanted? Wouldn't that be good? If we submitted a list of demands to God and say, Lord, go handle this. I'll wait for you uh, tomorrow to fulfill the list and, 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 do, it, and do, do them in order. Lord, I put them in order to make it organized. So just start at one and then just keep going down, right? And then you would have satisfied my will, right? Our pastors are sent for their heart for God. It's bigger, the heart for God is bigger than the heart for the people. Because in serving God, you serve the people. It's a lack of faith and faithless and faithless saints get swallowed up, right, by the whale, right? Look, look, why would God put Jonah in the belly of the whale? It's a dark place where persons go where a lack of faith or belief in tomorrow was substituted by an act of disobedience and now consequences. How many people have we run into that says I'm running from God? They know every ounce of scripture but insecure and afraid, even though, even, and there are those whom are preachers, afraid to get up there and for people to see them for whom they are. Sinners who have come to redemption and to be saved, yet continue to run and run simply because they fail to have the courage and the faith to stand up for what God would have them to be able to do. Not just with preachers or pastors, deacons who run, mothers who run, 
teachers who run, brilliance within congregations, but persons afraid to step up simply because of now the challenge and the tension and the friction. Look, this was not an easy task for Jonah to walk through this town of sinners. It could be frightening for you. It could be frightening for me. But if God is on your side, if you are within the wheel, it's not about you. It's about God. Can you live with that? Right? It, it's a task of faith. Church, faithless people end up at the bottom of the sea, swallowed by the whale. Because they have no belief in the God who have touched them, the gifts upon whom they had, of which they had. The person whom God calls and God inspires, who avoid the call, they avoid the call, like the state church, because of the challenge and of the difficulty. People would try to drown out God's voice by alcohol and by drugs or criticism or putting themselves into bad relationships, trying to blunt that, that voice, but the voice keeps coming because if God can reach this man in the belly of a whale, surely wherever you go, he can find you. Come on, what's that Nineveh you running from? Some, some of it is simple. You just need to be able to walk up to that person and say and, and ask for forgiveness. Not they forgive you, but ask for forgiveness. Or say, I'm sorry. Right? It's but it's bugging you. It's bugging you. It will bug you in your sleep and you. We'll choose ways out of it and then choose to make it worse. All right, I need to know, can you hear me? Because I'm getting a message that... Uh, yes, you, you glitched for a second, but you're back on. Okay. Got this message. Can you hear us? Or hear me? I got you. I got okay. you. Zoom must be saying you're preaching too long. <laughs> it is then, it is then. Look, 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 we look at this, right? And we find ways in which we can get out of doing the work of the Lord, right? We do. And, 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 and it can be, you know, Jonah, Jonah, he carries out the call of God. Look, these were people with whom he was uncomfortable, but still he had to go. He walked amongst them. And his proclamation to them, think about it, because he did what God wanted him to do, he saved lives. All the way up to the king, where the king made the proclamation, said nobody eat or drink anything. Think about this. Not only did he tell the people, he said, not even the animals. Animals got called in on this. Every living thing stop and give honor. Let's fast and ask for God's forgiveness and honor God. And, and, and the king didn't know if they would be saved. But you saw in the scripture where the scripture said, just maybe if we do this, God will relent from his judgment. And God saw it and gave them a pass from exterminating them. Oh, think about what it could be, right, 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 right. Think about the opportunities that we could have if we go to places that we haven't gone before. Those uncomfortable moments, can you do it? Can you reach now beyond that comfort zone of things that you love and become so comfortable with and now get into a place where it's inconvenient and still proclaim the word of God? Look, it's not about how many scriptures you can quote. That would be great. It's the heart in which you bring to the mission, which is what God is looking for. Obviously, he wasn't calling for perfection because he sent Jonah in there. 
And if it, and if he could send a Jonah in there, so can he send each and every one of us. Think about it, church. Like, what's your Nineveh? That's the question you have to ask. What is it? In some, in some, in some place, you may have to go back and correct some mess that you started some time ago. How many people have you pushed away from church simply because you didn't like what was going on for you at the church? Who did that? You got people, Ninevites, walking the earth and you got them involved in church politics? Who is it that you need to be able to open your heart up to and love, and but instead have closed it because of a broken heart and a soul that need to be mended? What's your Nineveh? Who is still at the cemetery? The people who we have dead and dead and buried, the people who, who, whom we have, there and still, they have gone on to glory, but we're still at the dirt. Without the push to be able to help and touch the next soul that can do it better for somebody else. You save one family, then you save them, then, then them kids get saved. And for generations to come, they'll be singing hymns and claiming a, a hold on to God's unchanging hand. All because somebody in the beginning, whether it was in the 18th or 19th century, somebody said, on this day, I claim Jesus as my Lord, and I claim my house to be saved, and that spirit have now transpired all throughout the centuries. Deacons have been born, soloists have been born, missionaries have been gone, pastors have been gone, all because somebody somewhere said, I'm saved, I take the Lord as my saving grace. You can't read this story without saying, saying you can love Jonah for chapter three, but you have to avoid the spirit of a Jonah that you see in chapter four. Be appreciative and, you know, and content in what, in what God is saying us to do. Give people the choice here, church. Let them say no. Look, this, this look, look, this, look, the journey can look ridiculous, right? But can be worth it. Come on, keep in mind this here, church. We almost done. Look, Noah had to build an ark, even though it wasn't no rain. He had to deal with the ridicule of his fellow citizens, even though it wasn't raining. But I tell you what, it did rain. And his family got through. Come on, Joshua had, look, Joshua, this man had to walk around the, with these gates for, well, for seven days. But the walls came down. A stuttering man who was elderly uh, 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 with this staff had to stand before a Red Sea with a wood staff and say, part so this people can go free. Or a shepherd. With, with, with no military training, with just a slingshot and some rocks. Was able to slay the giant and an articulate, well-statured man had to stand before a valley of dry bones and preach to them. Inconvenient but had to be done nevertheless. And think about this, uh, look, 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 God had to inconvenient now in his in his in God's creation put his essence in the midst of a manger and then to be ridiculed by the same sinners he was trying to save. You talk about inconvenient that even though he's feeding masses of people the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, still they came at him. Talk about inconvenient service. And then here it is, God's son is now 
up against in a trial, right? Who they going to pick? God's son, the one who have been doing this, or this murderer, this criminal. They took this word. And it says something about this world. This world would take the criminal in order to avoid accountability, then take the one whom God had sent. But God didn't stop there. God, that God took this one, gave him the strength with crowns of thorns, with spit on him, with whippings and beatings, inconveniently in his march up Calvary Mountain. Died on Friday, but early Sunday morning he rises. And now sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Inconvenience. It may not look, it may look a little scary to us. It may look a little off, but God said go, so we have to go. And I guarantee you, if God said do it, it's something good on the other side. Right? We just have to trust God. Because there's a whole group of Ninevites that need to be saved. And the church would not be doing what it needs to do if it ran and got caught up in the belly of the well simply because of our fear for seeing God's grace and the saving power of Christ Jesus. Don't let it, don't, don't, don't let us run from it, church. Let us run to it. There's an opportunity right now for us to run to it and give God all the praise. Come on, let's praise God for his holy word. And we thank him for his grace and for all of his mercy. And we thank God for his word.